love it. Have you ever, you ever got so excited about something that you just heard or you just found out and you just got stoked? I mean, you got so jazzed about it that you just wanted to run out and tell someone about it? You know, that, well, frankly, you just did it. You ran out and told someone. You know, I don't know what your life's like. <laughs> I don't know what it was like when you got saved, but you know, man, the first thing that happened to me when I got saved was I ran in the door, told my mother, Mom, I got saved. I'm born again. You know, I started to tell her some things and she told me, go to your room. So I went to my room, but it didn't stop there, you know, and that was 35 years ago. I mean, I don't know what, what it's like for you, but for me, huh. And I'm taking a shower, you know, and I'm thinking, well, Lord, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to tell the people today? You know, I said, man, you know, that holiday stuff's been bugging me. You know, it's every time I go to post something, somebody's got some attitude or some reason they can't do something. And then when someone wants to do something, everyone else is telling them why they can't do something. And nobody seems to be talking about you. And then they want to put you in it, but they don't really want to put you in it. They want to put you're the reason in it rather than you being you. And I'm like, hey, I'm warned you. I don't get it. So then God talks to me, calms me down. You know, it's always in the shower, you know, of all places. I mean, there are times where I'm in the shower, just no lie, truthfully. I'm in the shower and I'm thinking, and I'm listening and God's telling me some things. I'm going, man, I want a video camera right now. And I, I probably would keep it on my face, but <laughs> I'd probably start teaching right there. It's so cool. Man, I just get this stuff from the Lord and I go, wow, that's cool. Oh, I got to go tell somebody. So then I run to the camera and, Lord, <laughs> let's tell them. <laughs> let's shake the world up. Let's share Jesus. Oh, it's so hilarious. And people think I'm kidding. They think, you know, ah, you can't be that way. You know, the guy must be, you know, like exaggerating for for the audience. <laughs> um, he must be telling a story about what his life's really like. It's like, no, <laughs> I get, I take a shower and I'm almost guaranteed to hear from God. It's more of that, usually a bath. But boy, it was so exciting today because I was, I was in that shower, you know, and I was talking to God about, you know, some of my issues, you know, that people seem to dump on me, and uh, I kept thinking about, Lord, you know, what is it with them, you know, and then God spoke to me, and he said, it's a matter of the heart, it's a matter of the head, and it's a matter of the hand, and man, it was like God goes, now watch this, and he just touches me, you know, like inside my head, so to speak, you know, and he kind of goes, you know, it starts rearranging some of those neurons and protons and photons and whatever ons, you know, and starts making me on and puts the spiritual into the practical and the practical into the, you know, pragmatic and the pragmatic into the emotional and then he kind of lets it explode inside my head and I go, wow, it fits. Because you see, when God talks to me, I don't necessarily just, you know, run with it. Oh, this is, you know, God, or this is the Word of God. I already know it's the Lord, but I always kind of think about it, you know, and kind of ponder it, and people would say meditate on it, where usually my thought process is like, bam, 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 and I'm firing off all my neurons, you know, and I'm hitting all these different places and considerations and expansions and, you know, ramifications and stretching it out every which way but loose, you know, to get all that I can out of it. But the Lord was speaking to me about what our head is like what our heart is like, and what our hands are about. You know, because a lot of what we do, now, most people say, well, what about the tongue? You know, well, yeah, I mean, the tongue's there, but you'll see why it's really the heart, not the tongue or the mouth. And believe me, I know all about mouths. <laughs> I know about noses, too, but we won't go there. But the Lord was talking to me about the, the head, you know, and how our mind and our eyes and our ears, you know, really 
affect a lot of our faith. You know, the head is kind of like a controlling influence, determining what kind of input we're going to get, what we're going to receive, and then what we're going to act upon. So God was telling me that, you know, matters of the head, you know, need to be addressed, you know, and I thought, wow, yeah, you know, like, be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is a perfect except the little God in Christ Jesus, um, that we need to wash, be washed in our mind by the water of the word, that we need to change our programming from the distractions and attractions of that which is in the world and to those things that are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. And I'm going, and I'm going, in a mile a minute. And the Lord goes and waits and watches me in the shower, running with my mind, just bang! My mind's going everywhere. And I'm all excited and stoked. And I'm jazzed. Yeah, Lord, back to the head. Okay, we got it. Oh, well, we're going there. The and I'm thinking, man, I gotta write this down. I'll forget it. And then it's like, no, the Holy Spirit said that He would not. He would cause you to remember all things whatsoever I taught you. So you don't need to write it down. You don't need to plan it out. You don't need to make an outline. You don't need to make a format. You just need to go with the Lord and you know, trust Him and what He's going to do and what He's going to say and how He's going to do. So, needless to say, the Lord waited on me. And <laughs> I'm shampooing my hair. Of course, that's the head. <laughs> So about the time I get done with all this really cool stuff, it's cool. Believe me, if you want me to repeat it, I can talk a mile a minute and we can do that. <laughs> but I don't think you'd watch this video. But then the Lord told me, and it's a matter of the heart. And I went, ooh, yeah, the heart. For out of the heart, you but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's right, Lord. So it wouldn't be the mouth and the tongue because it's really from the heart. And it's initiated in the heart. And the attitudes of the heart, which are controlled by the mind, affect that which is being spoken. And so what's being spoken really comes from the heart in the beginning. And out of the heart comes evil, beguilings, misgivings, all these other things, you know, and yada, 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 and everything evil and everything good. And all these things are coming from the heart. And you have to change your heart. And then you take a stony heart out and you put a heart of flesh. And then he would change that heart and make it anew. And he would cause it to become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that we would come into it and it would be worshiping and we could have you inside of us and that you would live with us so that we'd be no longer us and living with you living us. So, needless to say, I'm going into the heart issues and dealing with them. And then I'm going, wow, man. And then the heart, it's the soul. You know, the heart is the very center of the soul and that's where it comes from. And the emotions are tied into the soul and it's soulful and it's the heart. And then I go into all the feelings, you know, and all the ramifications of going by feelings and not by faith and the fact of our faith is demonstrated by the emotions that we convey within the heart that we have within us as we exemplify them by what we're feeling and as we respond to that which is the input that our mind is controlling and we put in place by way of the proper perspective of having faith, fact, and feeling and keeping in reality the, the declination of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is the last because he's the feelings and Jesus would be like, you know, the soul and the Father would of course be the head so so, yeah. running a mile a minute. So in the shower, of course, as I'm scrubbing my chest down. With all this hair, you got a lot of chest to scrub. <laughs> I'm going a mile a minute. The Lord's waiting on me. And then the hand. Oh, boy. Then I look at my hands and I'm going, yeah, you know, you put soap on it, you know, and then you scrub down and you wash it with it. And it's the things you do, you know, it's what do you do? You know, your hands, they're the action for, it. you know, your hands are doing something, you know, like you could commit murder with your hands. You could build something with your hands. You could point to something with your hands. You could move your hands when you're talking. <laughs> so I'm all into that. And the Lord's waiting on me as you're waiting. So what's the point? Well, the Lord gave to me, kind of, in Scripture, the whole concept of there being, you have to involve your heart, your head, and your hands to get a full appreciation of all that God intends you to be. Because it's easy to just be a Jesus-only person, or it's easy to be a Spirit-only person, or it's easy to be, oh, holiness person, meaning God the Father, because usually people don't say God the Father when they mean treating God as holy and reverent. So, in a way, if you think about that, the head, the heart, and the hand of the body of Christ controls all that we do and say and be, and that 
our reverence, so to speak, of God, you know, is intentionally designed to come from our head. And our love of Jesus, our admiration of him, our relationship to him, comes from literally inside our heart. That there in our soul, Jesus resides as a high priest, you know, ruling over the emotions of the soul. And then our hands are manipulated and used and determined by the gifts of the Spirit and the gifting of God by who causes us to use and operate within certain abilities that the Holy Spirit has caused us to be as a living being. So then our hands would become the actions of God operating in unity. And so if we bring them in conformity, the head, the heart, and the hand, it would be like three that bear witness, you know, the fire, the blood, and the water. You know, those kind of things, you know, that were kind of like, man, you know, you think on it for a while and you kind of get the whole picture. Kind of like body, soul, and spirit, you know. We know we're a tripart being. I mean, you can look at nature and find lots of things that are tripart. You know, they, they have three aspects to them that are still the same one, but there are three aspects of them. And the same thing is true about your body, your soul, and your spirit. You know, you're, you're still one person, but you have... A body and a soul and a spirit. Each one of those seem to operate kind of independent, sort of. You know, I mean, let's be real. The body wars against, or the flesh wars against the flesh, the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. What do you say? Okay. Schizophrenic Christian, tripartite personalities. But in thinking on these three aspects, I prayed about it. I said, Lord, what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to tell the people? What do you want me to share? And God said, start a series, you know, just begin to relate your excitement, your joy, as you always do. But, you know, pick those things that are true from the scriptures and apply them, you know, to the body, the soul and the spirit, but really the heart, the head and the hand. And so we're calling this series The Heart, The Head, and The Hand because we want to approach it examining what the issues are mentally, meaning logically, and, you know, expanding out the thoughts. Like sometimes I think people will take an idea and they won't think it through, but they'll run with it in their heart. So they kind of shoot off their mouth sometimes with what's in their heart, not thinking before speaking. And so what happens is that you hear these issues that really aren't issues because they're only operating within the heart that they feel. For instance, like Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know, they'll, they'll have this feeling inside that they want to run with. So they tell someone, oh, you can't do Christmas. It's got Christmas trees. It's pagan. It's this. It's that. Well, they're only operating from their heart because really Christmas... <laughs> It's Christmas. I mean, where, what other Christmas, what other Christian thing is there? Thanksgiving? Well, that's more turkey. You know, but, boy, you know, I mean, even a Jew knows Christmas is Christian. I mean, come on, you know. You can't get more Christian than Christmas. So, anyways, the point being is that, I mean, I still think about this. How could you call Christmas not Christian? I mean, you know, no matter where it came from or how it started, what it is, is what it is, and today it is Christian. So let's get real. Oh man, you know, we don't hark the herald angels sing on our Christmas tree, we hark the herald angels sing because we sing it. You know, I mean, it's about the other things too that make any holiday Christian, or it's the other things that make you a Christian. It's not because you walk into a church, I mean, come on, you know, let's get real. Or because you, you put on a cross, so now all of a sudden you're a Christian. No, of course, it's the other things, the heart the head and the hand. So the fact that you're doing something, you know, in, in Christmas, this issue of Christmas, is the hand. You're just doing it. I mean, it's just a holiday. But then when you involve your heart, then of course you involve other things. So that's what makes it or changes it according to what you are and how you relate to it. So God was telling me about these issues here, about how to relate them, you know, in the heart, the head, and the hand. And how that can be like Proverbs 3, 5, 6, you know, a lot. Because God gave me in discipleship that 
probably all discipleship could be summed up into one scripture, which was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And when I got that, I thought, cool. And I thought everybody else already knew that, but you know, they had all these other things to teach people and to tell them about, you know. And I, I kept telling people, well, you know, really, the only scripture I'd tell you to memorize is just one. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and not until I know an understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Now, let's tear it apart, and then you'll see why it's so deep, and why you'll never do it all, but you'll keep working on it the rest of your life. And then I'd explain to them what trust is, and who you trust in, not what you trust in, and where you trust, and all the other things, and, you know, and what it means to be all your heart, you know, and how you be not your own understanding, and how that applies to really everything in life, so if it's in all your ways acknowledge him, then you got to not understanding your own understanding and kind of apply where your heart is at. So really that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 worked. So then the Lord gave me this head to heart and hand. I thought, ooh, this is cool. <laughs> you know, I like it. So that's what we're doing. You know, we're going to begin to discuss probably, oh, I don't know, whenever the Lord wants to do it. Maybe it's Sundays. Maybe it's weekends. But... To begin to discuss, you know, the head issues, the heart issues, the, the hand aspects of it, the applications of it. The, the hand is really like application, how you do what you do, the way you do it, and how, what you're doing. And so Christmas for me, you know, was the, the tipping point, so to speak. It was like people were attacking each other and acting like snapping dogs, you know, not being able to find a way for everybody to celebrate what they want to enjoy without compromising in some way. And I guess that's where you have to balance the head, the heart, and the hand, because on the one hand, your head, you're telling yourself, well, I don't want to compromise the reverence towards God and holiness, you know, and I want to treat, you know, Silent Night as a holy night, you know, and not put Santa in it. But then your heart is kind of like, wow, look at the joy. Santa Claus is coming to town, you know, and it's like, it's easy when you're sleeping. It's fun. We're having a good time with the kids. You know, we're playing. We're enjoying, you know. But then your hands go, but, you know, there's a conflict here, you know. So you put one head on your, one hand on your head and one head on your heart, and you kind of go, ooh, confusion. So really, what you do with it is up to you. But the hand knowledge would be, Here's a way to take the scriptures that you can open the Bible and see how to apply these things. Because bottom line is the scriptures do have an answer. I mean, Jesus had the same problem in his day that we have in ours. In his day, instead of it being Christmas, they had Hanukkah. Now, Jesus already knew, because he was there as the Son of God, that Hanukkah was a, a made-up tradition. I mean, the rabbi said, oh, hey, you know, God gave us extra oil so that the, the lamp would keep lit, you know, and everyone knew that that was not true. <laughs> and if they knew it in that day, believe me, changing it for our day didn't change the fact that they knew it in their day and they wrote about it. So even though it was like a kind of a corrupt priesthood that was trying to do the right thing and kind of like not doing the right thing, Jesus still celebrated the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple as a tradition because he took what was going on as a tradition at that time, Hanukkah, and the lighting of the seven branch menorah, not the nine. There was no nine in those days. That was made up in the, shoot, hundreds of years later. You know, there was no Hanukkah. Come on. What Jew would dare to change things that had been described in heaven? To something that you know, is a good idea. But later on in life, as the temple was destroyed and they quit walking with God, well, yeah, then they came up with Hanukkahs. But anyways, in Jesus' day, he had to deal with these kind of like contradictions that was like, well, you know, God, what do we do about Feast of Dedication? On the one hand, it's all about dedication of the temple, which is a good thing, the house of God. On the other hand, it's got this miracle attached to it that didn't happen. Kind of like the Santa Claus and birth of Jesus routine, you know, you kind of, which one, you know, what do you want to do here? You know, is the birth of Jesus on December 25th? Well, no, not really. But then again, was the Feast of Dedication really all that important when Jesus said that our bodies had become the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
and that the house of God at the time that Jesus came didn't have the Holy Spirit in it because the Holy Spirit was in Jesus. Oh well, so really the Feast of Dedication wasn't that important. And Hanukkah, as it was becoming, you know, by the rabbis and rabbinical tradition, wasn't that important. But the people had already been celebrating it, so what did he do? He said, on that day, as they were casting the water upon the pavement, on that day when they were lighting the giant menorah in Jerusalem, he said, I am the light of the world. Ah, so people took of their day of their celebration and applied it to what Jesus said, because Jesus took that and made it personal to himself. And you see, that's what the heart of God is like. God isn't so interested in what you do with Christmas. He isn't so interested in what you do with Kwanzaa, of all things. Oh boy. He doesn't care what you do with Hanukkah. <laughs> hey. He cares if you bring him with you. You see, he's in your heart, so you're going to go with him wherever you go. He's in your soul, so you're going to take him wherever you choose to. If you decide to be angry about it and wrathful and malice and, you know, trying to, you know, be some kind of Old Testament prophet, then remember, he's in your soul and he's there. And Jesus really didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to the world that through him they might find salvation. So this whole head issue, heart issue and hand issue of how you apply it really is a big deal to God because you're taking God with you. So Jesus gave us the example of how you could apply it. He not only demonstrated that he was the light of the world, he appeared at the Hana, at the menorah, at the time of its lighting and taught from there. You can bring the joy of a Santa Claus that acknowledges Jesus into your life, into your children's lives, into the lives of people around you. You can enjoy it. It's not meant to be a holy day. I mean, come on. They already defined those. And believe me, the Jews got it defined. <laughs> it's in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus. But you can make the holiday fun. You can celebrate it like it's supposed to be. It's a seasonal thing. It's a way of changing your attitude, your head, your heart, and your hands into one of demonstrating what it's like to be a Christian as children of the light, as children celebrating the light, as being one who isn't always, oh, we can't, 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 can't. But rather, a true born-again Christian shows the world what they can and what they can do and what they are. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus came into the world and brought light. And in him was the light of the world. And they saw a great light and they were amazed by the truth of every circumstance and situation that he was brought to. Everything that he was confronted with, he always brought the hard issue to the surface. And then he gave the answer that always brought mercy and grace and a love from a father in heaven that demonstrated that God was not mad. God was showing salvation. And that's what we are to do in this world, in our traditions, in our celebrations, in our holidays. So. If you get a chance, take a shower and talk to God. See if he doesn't have something to say about your angst against or your angst for Christmas or this season. And see if you're operating from only your heart, only your head, or only your hands, whether that be slapping it down or lifting it up. Because you see, Jesus, when he died, gave his heart, his head, and his hands to God Almighty. And God used it in a way that brought salvation to the world. And he can do the same with you.